called our first uh, temporary public art project at 3rd in Detroit called Fireflies with Kansas City artist, um, and that was really magical and wonderful. And then um, our second um, two artists came to us, and that was Jeffrey Hicks and Grace Grothus, and that project is still in place right now at the center of the universe, and it's called Trace. So now we're about ready to have our next project, and um, one Sunday morning, I'm watching CBS Sunday Morning, and we see this really great segment about an artist named Patrick Dorgeby. And so when we met a couple days later, I was like, this is our guy. And immediately, <laughs> each of us go into our sort of roles and perspectives of what to do and how to pull this off. And um, Joan C. starts thinking, okay, let's write a grant to the National Endowment for the Arts, and let's make this about placemaking. Bob Sober starts thinking, this guy's gonna need a lot of source material. <laughs> so he immediately goes to Michael Patton of Land Legacy, and he goes, we wanna bring in this guy, and he's gonna need a lot of raw material. Okay, let's walk right across the street or down the street to Upper Trees. Let's talk to Steve Grantham. And so then Steve Grantham was like, oh, I can help you with that. That is no problem. There's lots of areas we need to brush hog for safety reasons. And so we thought, well, oh, there's another major hurdle out of the way. So then we go back to the concept of placemaking. How do we um, build and develop that thought? And where do we install this project? And we had always been eyeing the Chapman Green as a park that we wanted to, to bring life to. And so when you are placemaking for the um, um, arts world, you want to take an art project or an art installation and use it as a catalyst for change. So when we did this, we then began to realize we had to build out um, our um, partnerships and our efforts with um, more people involved. So we added two new members to the Urban Core Art Project, and one of them is Ken Busby, and the other one is Leanne Moss. So when we did that, yes, we should give them a <laughs> So when we did that, and we knew we wanted to develop this concept of placemaking, we then talked to Sean Schaefer at the OU Urban Design Studio. And he has five fantastic um, graduate students that have been leading for the last six months, would you say, Sean? Six months, um, these students have led all the stakeholders around this project and this park to say, what do you want to see in the park? What do you want to do differently? What could it look like? How can this art installation be a catalyst for change in the programming, what goes on in the park, who uses it, and how do we activate the space? And then from there, we realized that we wanted to be inclusive of all the people in and around the park. So we then talked to the Mental Health Association and those that live quite literally near the park have been included in this process through different ways of being involved in it, helping to make things, um, being stewards of the park. Um, we're developing that even further by uh, working with TCC, Center for Creativity, and in the fall, the mental health clients will have an art show in conjunction with TCC. With that said, you know, how do you program a park? How do you make it active? We then brought in Mayfest. We have the downtown disco de um, deco district um, as members as well. We have Tulsa University as partners in this process. So we have really gone to great lengths to make something really exciting and engaging. But first and foremost, we cannot do that without Patrick. And Patrick is an internationally recognized artist with over 300 installations around the world. And so this is his first installation in Oklahoma, and we couldn't be more excited. So please, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for your suffering <laughs> <laughs> to begin with. You know, I'm going to talk and say a few words first and then show you some images. Uh, my son Sam, who's my assistant, when he was a kid, he had a children's book about three bears that encountered urban sprawl. Well, these bears, little bears, they go up over a hill near their den one morning. They look down, and somebody's built a shopping center overnight. <laughs> well, already people are hustling and bustling up and down the sidewalk, and they all look so satisfied. Well, the little bears, they're not sure they're happy anymore. Somewhere they find people clothes. In the next sequence of pictures, you see these little pint-sized figures 
moving amongst the legs of all the other passers-by, and the caption reads, well, now that they're like everybody else, are they really happy? Well, no, not really, because underneath those people clothes still beat their furry little animal hearts. Well, a big wind comes up, it blows and it blows, blows men's ties out, women's skirts up, one big gust blows all the little bear's clothes off, and for the first time, they realize who and what they are. They go tearing back across the parking lot, back to a place they could just be themselves. Wasn't so many years ago, as a crow flies, that I was getting ready for work. I had a coat and tie on and a briefcase. I start down my walkway, really big wind comes up. And it blows and it blows. My first gust blows my briefcase right down the street. The second blows off my coat and tie. The third blows everything else away. <laughs> As I'm standing there, completely amazed at this unlikely turbulence in my life, the only thing I could feel under those people clothes is this thudding of an animal heart. And I had flashbacks to all the times in my life that all I could think about was giving up my regular life, going off into the distance, maybe into the wilderness, building a small cabin, and living in a more essential way. Well, you know, it was a time for change, of change for me, and I found myself at the how-to section of the library. I saw things like load bearing and R factor and coefficient. I said, maybe building a house, even a small cabin, is a whole lot harder than I thought. <laughs> well, luckily for me, as I start back across the library, I happen to stumble on a stack of National Geographics. And maybe the first that I picked up was an article on the barrios of Rio de Janeiro, in which a segment of the population, the disenfranchised, have to go out and highway, into the highways and byways, pick up the cast-offs that didn't dry to suburban life and take that material somewhere and build them some place to live. So I know I'm not supposed to like this because these are really poor people. And yet they've done an amazing job with the materials that they had at hand. And in my mind, it constituted a kind of raw aesthetic. Or maybe it was an article about a tribe from the Amazon basin who had to go into the jungle, forage whatever was available to build the things they need. So I know these huts don't have any running water or electricity, but they're beautiful and they look so, so well back into the environment from which the material was drawn. Or maybe it was a bird from Africa that had done an amazing engineering feat. I said, I know these birds are not smart enough to do this, but in human terms, this would be considered amazing craftsmanship. It's then I realized that maybe I wasn't a normal builder. Maybe I was a hunter and gatherer, some kind of an inspiration builder. And you know, I did get started on that house, and I learned some things while building it that really stood me in good stead in, the, in my art life. Really, the first is as simple as it's learning to accept your progress. If you don't know much about building, you put a window in in the morning, by the afternoon you're thoroughly disgusted with yourself. You're about to jerk it out of the wall. So even before I get, began the process, in order to be fair to myself, as I said, you know, I'm going to do the very best job I can do. And every day, at the end of the day, I'm going to accept my progress, and the next day I'm going to build on it. The second thing is if you use non-standard materials like so many sculptors do, you can't always go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the things you need. And similarly, if you decide to cut a big tree down and use it as the mainstay of your house, how do you know it would work and who would you ask? Well, I played a game with myself. I, cut, I called it giving it my one best shot. And I said, if there's nobody left on earth, if there's nobody to ask, what do I think? Do I think it's strong enough? And somewhere along there, I began accepting responsibility for the kinds of things that I designed and made. The third thing is that working day in and day out in a very unselfconscious way, I began to see what I liked and what I didn't like. I saw how important personal preference is in making those decisions. And over a period of time, I began to develop my own sense of personal aesthetic. And finally, I saw how important need was in getting anything done. You know, I really needed this house. So I was able to coalesce my best energies and direct my best problem-solving skills. And sometimes when I have a friend that's not doing that well with their sculpture, I say, hey, you have to figure out how to need it. Well, I didn't know it was getting out of hand, but my neighbors did. <laughs> uh, they were always coming down to my house and scratching their head and kicking the dirt. And once my friend Brooks brought a relative from another area of the country, he said, yeah, I like what you're doing here. You're a real artist. Well, maybe for all of you, that would be a great thing for somebody to say about you. But for me, I felt like the edge of the earth, and I really wanted him to take it back. 
upon reflection, I realized that as a child, I thought being an artist was the greatest thing you could be. The only trouble was it seemed to come with this tremendous sense of social responsibility. You were supposed to do something good, something earth-shaking, something that saved people. And it came with that onerous word, talent. Somehow you were supposed to be talented. I knew what that word art and talent, uh, art and, and, uh, and talent meant to Michelangelo and Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. I just couldn't figure out what it had to do with me or anything I was doing at my house. Well, one morning, as if by magic, I found myself enrolling in the nearest art, de art department taking art history and sculpture classes. And you know, for me, that minute, that day, was the best day of my life. Because I didn't know there was anybody else like me. I didn't know there were lots of people that liked handling material, liked working just to feel the material, liked seeing their ideas get worked out in three dimension. The only trouble was I was kind of an art nerd, and I'd walk around and say, is this art? Is this art? How, how come this person gets to paint this board blue and call it art? And I was just about to hold forth again when one of the professors, Mike Sender, grabs me by the throat, begins choking me to death, and says, who in the hell cares if it's art or not? Why don't you just go in there, make whatever you're going to make. Who's going to know the difference in 20 years anyway? So I actually needed that permission giving, and I think I learned some things while I was in school that helped propel me towards becoming a working artist. The first thing is the importance of a role model. Because I didn't know if you had to have a psychiatrist standing by when you made your first piece, uh, whether you had to endure great family upheaval, or whether you had to go to a major city and work as a waiter in order to qualify. <laughs> it wasn't until I saw these relatively normal people who were intensely interested in making things that I realized there was going to be some hope for me. The second thing is it's hard to be a food fattest unless there are other people around who eat beans and rice. And similarly, it's hard to be a working artist unless there are other people around who understand what you're going through. I'd say my biggest challenge as a working artist is maintaining a sense of personal equilibrium, that in a society that gives high marks to culture, but really in ignores individual makers. Uh, it's easy to have an identity crisis at any time in your career, and then, you know, all of a sudden you go into your studio and you don't recognize who made the work. It's at that point that you are glad that there's a university art department around or that you have a friend in a distant location. You call them up, or, are you still working? And somehow, yeah, I am. And so you're released to go back and work in your own studio. The third thing is I began to see there was a big difference between doers and viewers, between people who make things and people who look at them seriously. Museum directors, gallery owners, curators, you know, their job is to figure out what object is more inherently interesting one than another, or where something fits in the lifeline of art. You know, that's not my job. I have to be true to my materials, true to my ideas. And if I had to worry about whether something was art historically significant or good before I began, you know, I would just never get started. And finally, I had to worry about that word talent. And I decided that although talent wasn't irrelevant, it just wasn't the issue. I had the right to make what I wanted, whatever I, whenever I wanted. Basically, I could do as much work as I could afford. Well, at a magic moment, I quit school, went home, <coughs> built a studio, and got to work. But you know, it's one thing to know you have a right to make something. It's another thing to know how you're going to make it and what you're going to make. Uh, luckily for me, I uh, stayed in touch with the university and went to a lecture by a woman named Marty Zelts who had been a seamstress in her life before sculpture. <laughs> and she brought Velcro fasteners and zippers and cloth to, her, cloth to her work. As I'm leaving that lecture, I'm asking myself, I wonder what I already know. I wonder what simple technology, what simple <laughs> method of joining that I might already be familiar with. And as I'm driving down the road back to my house, I see the sides of the road in North Carolina where maintenance crews strive to keep all of these small saplings down. And like Paul being struck off his horse on the way to Damascus, I had an epiphysis. I said, maybe I could use those. Well, it wasn't so unusual that a woodsman like myself would see the potential of the saplings along his driveway because they're plentiful, they're renewable, and it's just like having a giant warehouse always at your fingertips. After working with this material for a while, I realized that I had a deeper resonance with it. I had grown up in the woodlands of North Carolina and we have lots of underbrush and intersecting lines. 
and as some kids laid in fields and looked at the architectural details of clouds, I found myself looking at the drawing quality of the winter landscape, all those potential pictures up there. So when I turned to sculpture, it seemed easy to co-opt the forces of nature and play that natural drawing style out onto the surfaces of these large works. Before I could begin, I had to figure out what birds and beavers and other natural shelter builders already know about sticks. And that is that they have an inherent method of joining. If you drag a stick through the woods, you see what I mean, you start out pulling it like this before, you know, it's got that infuriating tendency to tangle with everything it touches. That's really the simplest method of joining. And every stick has a little flexibility, so if you flex it, pull it through the matrix and let it go, it kind of snaps back and it holds itself in place. Well, that's the, that's the how, but the what? If you had seen me at the time, you would have taken pity on me. I could spend maybe five minutes in a museum and then I'd run down the steps with sweaty palms going, you know, I think they've used all the good ideas up. <laughs> <laughs> or, you, you know, you read an art magazine and, you know, you really start getting a headache and you say, well, I think they've exploited every material. And then in the last census, over a million people in New York City alone claim to be visual artists. You say, whoa, there are too many of us. <laughs> uh, but after worrying about this for a while, I realized I really love to make things and the art world was just going to have to lump it. Before I say, uh, show you a few images, I just say two other things. One about the art world in general, and the other about creativity. You know, for me, the art world is not a wall. What it is is a loosely knit group of people, a uh, group of jobs filled with people, good people like you and I. And those people don't tell artists what they want to do. Artists have to decide what they want to do. So there's not one person in the arts who haven't thought about being taken to a major city in a fiery chariot where they and their work get what it deserves. But we all want different things. Some people want to live in a certain place. They want a certain kind of car. They want a certain number of children. And it's all these real world activities that help set the um, priorities as to what kind of opportunities you allow yourself to be available to. The second thing is, you know, I, I have a pair of clippers. I arrive and three weeks later I have to have a good piece. So I've thought a couple of things about creativity. One is that hysteria rides on the shoulder of every creative person. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you want to go somewhere and get going, you have to figure out how to harness your hysterical energy. The second thing is that I have different states of being. I have a state of being in which I do my laundry and eat my dinner, and another state of being in which uh, it's a door behind which all my problem-solving skills lay. The question is how you go over there and open that door quickly. Uh, when I'm at home and, and I happen to be there once, in, once a month, and my friends come over and we start talking and you can see the cares of the world falling away. You think you ought to be on a, a talk show of some, of some sort. Uh, then you realize that maybe the best state for making is one in which you're unselfconscious but fully yourself. And that's the state of making I seek. It's not about wringing your hands or feeling depressed or worrying. It's really a sensation of being with your friends. One of the curious things about my work is that there's no studio doors to close and no place to hide. All my work is done in, in full public view. And, you know, for some artists that'd be consternating, but for me, I feel like it's a cultural exchange, one in which those people that help me and the, organization, the neighborhood in which I am, that energy is folded back into the work itself. And when I'm on site, I like representing making in a positive way. I like interceding for the arts. I like demystifying the process. But mainly, I like reminding people that artists are just normal people who are looking for their rightful place in the world of work. So I'd like to show you, uh, if you can endure, I'd like to show you a few images of my work. Let's see, got a point in, uh -oh. There they all are. <laughs> that was quick, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Hey, that's my house. That's what I. That's where I lived. That's where I. What I built when I ran away. And uh, it's really held me in good stead. Here we go. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm not pressing these things. Oh, okay. You're pressing them. Yeah. Okay, it's that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Technical, Technical glitch. 
of a now person. One more? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, there again, that's my house. <laughs> that's my stone wall. I dug all those stones out the back of the hill. That was my first stone project. I've done a lot since then. Uh, that's my cat. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've learned to sequence materials. I do that now, but and then it meant putting all the good rocks inside and all the bad rocks on the back. <laughs> I gathered lots of cedars from my woods and split it out so that, um, you know, they became my ceiling. doesn't have to be painted. Uh, this was my first attempt at sticks. I, when I moved there, I cut all the sticks and made me a shed. And, uh, this was my first attempt at rocks. So this is uh, my stone monument. I figured if nobody was going to build a monument to me, I'd just build one to myself. <laughs> but I, I collected all these rocks between my house and town. And uh, I like a stone wall that has, you know, feature stones and a lot of little goodies and, and uh, plenty of uh, different colors. Oh, but my neighbors were always telling me when they uh, finished, when their kids finished college, things were going to change. This is called waiting it out in Maple. <laughs> and uh, I have a lot of neighbors, so I put it out there so they could see each other. Uh, I wanted to show you a little bit about materials. A lot of, when you see our work over in the park, you're going to think that we've got the longest lines in the world. But actually, we're using a lot of sticks that are just like about four or five feet tall, and your eye is making that jump. Uh, this is my friend Scott. We're working uh, it's kind of an addition subtraction problem. You know, you pull off the pile and build something like ruffle still skin working. Uh, this is at the Heron School of Art. Uh, oftentimes we're looking for places together that uh, they're already taking something out. This was going to be a new golf course, so the city of Indianapolis let us gather. Uh, uh, some sticks from Wyoming. Uh, somebody decided to take a bulldozer and clean their lake of willow, and that made twice as much willow, so we were the beneficiaries of that. Uh, this is in Hawaii on one of the volcanoes gathering strawberry guava and uh, eucalyptus and coffee tree and java plum and lots of other things that you can use that are flexible. This is in Ireland. This was a, a willow farm that raised uh, biomass for, uh, for a power plant, so we were able to take advantage of that. Uh, oh, this is in uh, Serbia. And this is the way they do it when you want to go gather something. And so we, uh, the, the river had come up that we had to use horses to, to take the sticks back onto dry land. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, I just want to show you oftentimes uh, we have to take care of leaves and we pick the leaves off. This is in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And uh, this was the piece we were making. It was uh, final work. It, it was kind of 11 uh, little cabanas. Uh, just a, a run through of one piece. This was in Ireland. This is a, a willow farm. A lot of times the willow was uh, used in the Middle Ages, you know, for every single living thing, and some of these farms survive. Uh, we always have to carry the material to where we were going. As some of you know, we've been hauling uh, material over to Chapman's Green. Uh, this was in uh, Dublin, and uh, they, the sponsors wanted me to work inside the fence. I was convinced that we should, people should be able to see the work, so I capitalized on this tree. And uh, in Ireland, there's a tradition of these Irish round towers built by monks in the 9th to the 10th century, so this was my Irish round tower. Uh, it's about 45 feet tall, and the living limbs that were part of the tree are on the outside. This is two years later. And you can see the tree, you know, it wasn't flourishing to begin with, but those are the, the, were the limbs that were alive. Uh, at Cornell University, another great uh, sapling site using maples, uh, getting them over to our site. Uh, I wanted to build a piece between the dormitory and the Performing Arts Center. I wanted to give a companion piece for each one of these trees. And so uh, you can see I've marked out the utilities on the ground. We were doing that over at Chapman's Green as well. Make a little drawing so that we could figure out how these things were going to relate to each one of the trees. Uh, mark it out on the ground. Yesterday we had uh, Bob's uh, electrical cords out there kicking them around trying to figure out uh, what these pieces were going to look like. Uh, we drilled some holes in the ground. We've been doing that too, thanks to Steve. And uh, 
Then today what we're trying to do is tie our first shape up over there so that we often uh, get the shape from uh, our, by setting scaffolding around our, our uprights and then pulling them and then we can cut them uh, loose later. So th this was uh, the scaffold, this was our final uh, product at the uh, opening. I wanted to talk about my work uh, and as how I work. This was at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, it's the county jail that's been given over to the college for a library. Since it was a jail, I thought escape hatches would be appropriate. <laughs> uh, maybe a magic carpet to get out. But uh, the way I work, and I'm working this way here too, is I work structurally first. In this case, I'm taking this platform lift and weaving into those jail bars some really big sticks. And you can see vaguely that there's some circularity started on that. It's like building a canvas and then drawing on it. So the second phase is kind of appliquing uh, a kind of look to it, a kind of drawn surface. So that's, you can see how I'm starting to develop it. And the final phase is cosmetic, where you go in and clean the surface up. It's basically erasing. If you get inconsistencies in the surface you don't like that much, you can put little sticks over them and erase them and then reassert lines uh, to help with the drawing quality. Uh, I want to talk about my work in terms of temporary. This is a pink and white dogwood. I bent the limbs down. I'm working over the surface of it. I knew I had three months before it would hurt the tree. So this is its second configuration. And then finally, you know, we had to take it down. And we're about to pull it behind the car to the dump, that, which is down the street. So uh, uh, this was at Swarthmore College. Uh, luckily for me, they had a tree that was going to come down and uh, so they allowed me to have it for two years. It had a strong vertical, which let me, and all the limbs were on the other side, so I was able to weave into the limbs and contrast a strong vertical uh, with this stacking motion called abracadabra. This was its winter configuration and uh, a kind of dramatic takedown, but this is after two years and they, they do, it is not a Mont Magic carpet. They do have a, a big arm that's holding the fellow up there. <laughs> Uh, this was a, a piece in Denmark at a place called Krakamaken where you have to gather the material in the park to work. Uh, my idea was uh, this little guy's called Little Big Man. He's looking at his reflection when he thinks about nature. He sees his own reflection. So you can crawl up inside him. Uh, the best part of it is that if this is more mythic. This is its winter configuration. The water floods in there. And then i uh, got this picture from two years later where the hero fell down. <laughs> uh, a piece at, and, um, somewhere. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a Frederick Martin Gardens in, in Michigan, and these are face jugs, and every society, uh, culture has had face jugs. We have strong play traditions in North Carolina where people made face jugs, the Romans made face jugs. This is my attempt at some good face jugs, and it's along a glass wall, so you look at, at, out at the sculpture and they look back at you. At, at the two-year mark, a big four-foot snow came tearing down the roof and left these little things screaming. Uh, this was an, a, an attempt to plant living material within the walls of a... Exist, uh, when we built the sculpture, we put live trees inside the walls, and so we kind of got a little bit of memory of it. This is, uh, this is five years later. Uh, this is seven years later, and now there's just a grove of trees sitting in the same spot. Uh, this is, uh, I want to talk about my work in terms of drawing, because all the conventions that you use with a pencil and a piece of paper use those same conventions with sticks. So you bring them out of the woods, they have the overtones of the, of the forest, but what you really are seeing then is lines with which to draw. And so all the kinds of Xing and uh, uh, various other things. When you strike a, a piece of paper with a pencil, you usually hit it with one weight and finish off with another. You're making tapered lines. Since sticks are tapered, if you organize those tapers in one direction, you get a sense of movement. And so that, that's what's happening here. This is at the North Carolina Museum. It's about 70 feet long, 16 feet high, and just the whole idea of being able to use emphasis lines and, uh, and suggest movement. Uh, a piece in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. These pieces are woven into the superstructure of the building up above the light track, and so they're, they're independent. You can touch them and they move on the floor. They, 
hang from the ceiling. It's made out of uh, willow and rosaria, this red twig dogwood. And I like it so much because it does show the sensitivity that you can apply to sticks to get the drawn surface. A piece in Denmark, uh, kind of sky writing. I just went across the road, got the materials, set some scaffolding up, and then we uh, sprung this into this poplar grove that sits on the North Sea. You come around a corner and it's very dramatic. This was at the World Trade Center. Uh, and uh, you know, if you deal with the Port Authority, they say, Oh, it's fine if you work here as long as you don't let a stick touch the walls, the floors, or the ceiling. <laughs> so I had seen the, uh, the electricians in the building using these ladders from Putnam Ladder Company, so I just called the ladder company. They were just two blocks down and said, hey, could I have some ladders for Lynn for a couple of months? So this is my kind of attempt at big city calligraphy. <laughs> And this is at the uh, Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. It's looking down through the Oculus from outside the building in their new stairwell. And so this is kind of sticks as slave to uh, kind of the geometry of, of, uh, of architecture. That's about 16 feet across there and three floors down. So oftentimes I have to work with the ongoing activity of a space and we just use spotters on the stairs. I used a platform lift and we built this piece while uh, people you know, use the stairs. Uh, a piece at the old uh, muse uh, uh, craft museum in New York City, and the se similarly trying to play off of the architectural uh, uh, design and lines in the building. Uh, you know, I'm always using volunteers in my work. U ultimately, uh, I, I saw the utility of working with an organization, using some of their volunteers, using their uh, goodwill and their leverage in a community to get organized. And uh, this is in France, and I, I know that one guy's a druggist, and uh, there's this, we use a variety of, of people, and uh, sometimes uh, those onlookers will say, well, how do they know what to do? I say, well, we've all been children, and we know everything about sticks. <laughs> so, so, so kids have a kind of a shadow life of our hunting and gathering past, and you know, for them, a stick is a weapon, a tool, a piece of a wall. It's just a very imaginative object, and it doesn't take long for anyone to pick up a stick and get some good ideas. Uh, you can see I had too many bottles of Bordeaux while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this lake was surrounded by restaurants where people came to have a glass of wine uh, during lunchtime. And uh, they're pretty tall. They're about 26 feet tall. And they lean on each other. So there's, they're in pairs, and that's what helps them stand up. Uh, this is my sponsors there taking a little walk. Uh, I wanted to put this in. This is at the Middlebury College. Uh, but this is how many people that it took to make this work. So we have a lot of great volunteers. There's a lot of closet stick gatherers out there. <laughs> Just like in North Carolina, people gather shells from the beach, but everywhere else, a good stick, you know? Uh, and uh, in Wisconsin, at, uh, somewhere, uh, these are all the people that were helping me there. And uh, this is a day in the office for me. I'm at the University of Michigan, and people come up and talk to you and they're always talking a bit and uh, it's inevitable that someone will come up and while the husband surreptitiously tries to push the sculpture over the wife says honey we could live here <laughs> and he's like no we can't live here and what i've come to know that means is that there's a desire uh, to cross the forest curtain and be without all your stuff and just breathe with the other animals and sometimes we have impromptu openings. This was in New Harmony, Indiana. We finished this. We took the scaffolding away. People jumped out of the barber chair, half shaved. They actually stopped their cars in the middle of the road <coughs> and came over to see uh, the final product. Uh, in Ireland, people come to visit you whether it's raining or not. These are a bunch of kids that stopped and the bus came out in Chicago. We had a person loved it. Oh, people send me pictures of their of themselves. I know these feet are from Houston. That's all I know about. And uh, they do uh, craft their hair according to the things being, being near a sculpture, you know. And, and also, you understand this, uh, but can you understand that? I don't. How about this? 
Somebody actually sent me this picture. So, you know, things happen when you're not looking. I, I would like to just talk briefly about my work in three ways. One, I've used architecture as a foil for my work, and this was in, uh, in uh, somewhere. <laughs> anyway, the whole idea that the Ducorder Museum and Lincoln Mass, it's the idea that a, that a tower or a, a castle is falling back to its origin as a surf, surf's hut or maybe a haystack. And so they weren't too keen on me being on the roof, uh, so I built this mock-up and took a, a crane and stuck it like a dunce cap up on the top. <laughs> it turns out that you couldn't see anything up there, so we had to go back and invest it with line. And so we found this bucket truck. And you know what happens really is you get up there at 70 feet, you're really afraid, and you need to get out there. So you just say to the driver, do you mind just grabbing my belt for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> you just hop on over there and start doing the work. And you can see that we did get some bigger lines up there. Uh, this was uh, an uh, insect attack on the Hollywood Art and Culture Center. Uh, we often, oh, this was Max Azria's store in El Melrose Avenue in, out in California, and we gave this store a case of the paisley cloth. <laughs> uh, we also, I also work with trees and use trees as matrix on which to work, and so this is in, in Japan. I'm using some kind of reed and some bamboo. A lot of times those sacred trees there are, have a rice rope around them, so that gave me the idea about building this larger than life cor cor cornucopia. These were kids that came and stood in it for me. You can see I built it in the verge of a bamboo forest with some other sticks and so forth. Uh, a, a work that was in England and uh, in this Leylandia hedge. If you look at a hedge like this, it seems so solid, but it's actually got these huge cathedral-like spaces within between the trees. And so I've capitalized on those by making these skylights into that and you can walk inside. And uh, just, uh, this work was in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And of, oftentimes, if you're gonna work in the trees, you have to work up because people don't look up that often. When you get in there, you realize this thing is 50 feet tall and we serviced it from the top of the building. We built this uh, massive uh, uh, scaffolding system. And uh, of course, I think of it as a roller coaster for squirrels. And so I've taken the limbs from two different trees and kind of woven across the, the, the limbs. I've also used the overtones of trees. This was down in Savannah and uh, a kind of an architectural folly. And you can look up and see these source limbs above and it dropped all this Spanish moss down on it. Really nice. And uh, a piece in Hawaii using this monkey pod tree as a foil. The, it's got a huge trunk system that as uh, you can see, uh, we, we had this stuff go up and, and make its uh, curves up on the, in the tree itself. Uh, this was the impromptu opening at, at the New Harmony, Indiana. Uh, they had a hornbeam heads that didn't have anything under it. So it allowed me to build a kind of cliff dwelling idea. Uh, it's, on, and it's a right angle to Main Street and there are a lot of windows over there. So I had to put my own fenestration uh, in under there. The great thing was it, it had this uh, winter configuration, which got a, it gave a lot of contrasting verticality. And uh, a couple of big heads in, in North Carolina, uh, each one of them is capitalized on around one cherry tree. And uh, so that, but also I have to work independently. And so if I don't have any trees to be in, I, I can't, uh, you know, I can't find a building to work on. They say, this is all you get. This is my earth saving turtle in, in uh, France. This is the place that I was working. I was working in their front yard. Uh, this was uh, a piece in Philadelphia at the Morris Arboretum. Um, you know, it started out as a snail shell in my garden and ended up uh, as Dr. Zhivago in the Summer Palace. Uh, that, I tore the, that piece was torn down and I built this piece instead, right in the same spot kind of like seven dancing little huts. Uh, this is a piece in North Carolina that I built for a private individual. And uh, what I like about it is there are no nails, wires, zip ties, nothing. It's just a, 
infuriating tendency of these things to tangle. Sometimes, and uh, you know, I'll be working inside and I won't really be able to uh, attach to the building. So this was in Brussels called Sleepwalking. And these pieces are about 27 feet tall and, and kind of inhabited this big museum space. Uh, at Purdue, I'm out on the roof looking at uh, something that's kind of after the uh, serpent mounds in the Ohio Valley. This is kind of serpentine, but uh, you can see the different colors of willow that we were able to pull out of this, uh, of the environment there. Uh, a piece at Bowdoin College, uh, the idea I've learned to hook various pieces together to help them endure snow, wind, etc. So these, uh, these pieces could, are attached at the hip. A piece in South Carolina uh, in front of a performing arts center called Ain't Misbehaving. And uh, there are five heads that look down a nexus of streets of five streets. So one, one, one face peers down each street. Uh, a piece in, uh, in Tacoma, Washington at, at the Glass Museum there and using the water to kind of help extend the look of the work. A new piece uh, that just came down that, at the, in the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Mass. The witches took it on as their own immediately. Uh, that's its winter. Oh, that was its winter configuration. Hey, but what really I wanted to show you is how many people will come to see a sculpture burned. <laughs> you won't believe this, but that's everybody in Scotland. <laughs> and this was a fatal piece. It was built after the Callanish Standing Stones. Uh, this was my scale model. This was the guy that brought me my scaffolding and took it home. Uh, this was that fatal night in which uh, the piece was set on fire. Big festival. Uh, this is the morning after. Can you believe that the dancers cooked their food, their breakfast on my sculpture? <laughs> I cannot. Thank you very much.